Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's good to see you this morning. We are glad to be with you, thankful to be back. Uh, and we just appreciate the opportunity and the chance to study again God's Word together. We feel like we started a study and we've just been paused for two years. And, and now we'll resume our study together. You have your Bibles this morning and you'd be turning to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're going to look specifically at verses 13 to 15. We're going to talk this morning about temptation. The title is Understanding and Overcoming Temptation. Have you ever been tempted? Anybody know what that is? Feels like? Yes? Been there? I could say the same. Been there, done that, bought the t shirt. I think that's what they say. We've been there. Temptation. Understanding it and overcoming it. I'm convinced that in order to overcome it, you first have to understand it, and that's what we want to do this morning. Time allowing, we'll get to some application and hopefully some things we can do to better deal with it. Uh, James, the book, sometimes you hear people refer to James as the Proverbs of the New Testament. They say that because of the practical nature of the book. It's not really that, though. James does have a theme and a point, and he does make a great illustration as he moves through his book. In fact, that's kind of how he writes. He, he, he makes a point, and then he illustrates the point. He will say something, and then he'll say, it's like this. And he does that throughout the book. You can see that as early as the first five, six, seven verses of, the, of chapter one. He, he talks about faith, asking in faith. And if you need wisdom, ask of God. And then he says, for the man who does not ask in faith, James says, he's like a double-minded man. Well, what's a double-minded man like? Then he says, well, he's like this. This is what a double-minded man is. He's unstable in all of his ways. And he goes throughout the whole book that way. He will say uh, a man's religion, uh, if, he, if he has words but he doesn't have deeds, and he says that man's religion is vain. That's chapter 1, 22. To 27, and he will say of that man, he's like a man that looks into a mirror, beholds himself, goes away, and he forgets what he saw. And he just marches all the way through the book that way. He'll make a point, he'll give you a great illustration, and he'll say, This is the point I'm making, it's just like this. When he comes to the subject of temptation, he does the same thing. Uh, he makes a point, and then he gives an illustration, and then he'll say, It's like this, this is what it is. And it's in that where we want to focus this morning. As you open up the book of James, the first 12 verses have to do with outward trials. The saints in the first century world are being persecuted. Those trials have come upon the God's people, and they are scattered, James says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Most believe it's probably the first book of the New Testament written, early 40s probably, Church is still largely Jewish in nature. And so James says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, they are on the run for their faith. And James actually says, count it all joy when you fall into the verse. King James says temptations, diverse trials. These trials are outward trials testing or on their faith. And James says, count it a joy when this happens because you can grow from this. It's not typically the way we think of trials, and yet it's the way the Bible talked about it. That trials can produce strength, perseverance, endurance, that we can actually be better on the other side of the trial. As a result of that, James says, count it a joy when you get to go into it. Because if you go through it, you're going to be better on the other side. The truth of the matter is, your faith, it's hard to grow faith without trial. It's hard to grow anything without trial. Has anyone ever tried to get in better shape? Yes, no, maybe so? Real easy stuff, isn't it? I mean, all you got to do is sit on the couch and watch television. And your, your shape just improves. And the more you eat sitting on that couch, the better it gets. No, that's not true at all. It's quite the opposite, isn't it? If you want to improve, you've got to go through trial. And it's the trial that makes you stronger. 
It's the taxation of the body. It's the changing of the diet. It's the getting off of the couch. It's the movement and the exercise. And that consistently, that overtimes bring results. Well, nobody does that without trial. Nobody does that and gets better without effort and energy and taxation. In fact, because we know that to be the case, it's why many of us haven't gotten started. It's, it's why I keep saying to myself, Eric, you need to. And Eric keeps saying back, yes, you do. And nothing has happened. Because it hurts. The same thing is true of spiritual faith. And if your spiritual man is going to have to be tried if he's going to get back. James says, count it a joy. Jesus said, blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Matthew 5, 10 to 12. I heard one preacher say that the book of James is how Christians practice the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. And that's probably not all bad. If you read what Jesus says and what James says, he's putting into practice what the Lord said would happen. These outward trials bring us down to verse 13 to 15. The outward trials, he stops talking about those and he starts talking about inner the trials that are ours as a result of temptation. There is the trying of faith, and then there is the temptation to sin. And those are two different things. James says in James chapter 1 and verse number 13, beginning, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So what we want to do to begin with is try to understand it. James begins in verse number 13 with this universal statement. If we're going to understand it, we must understand this. James says there is something that no man can say. When it comes to the subject of temptation, James says there are some things that cannot be uttered accurately. You can't say this. Well, what is it that James says no man can say. James says, no man can say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. And so, at the very beginning, we must understand that God is excluded for temptation. Ever we come to the subject of temptation, no one can ever blame God for the source of their temptation. Now, one of the things we should say very quickly about temptation is if you have the King James Version of the Bible and you read Genesis 22, 1, it will say, now after these things, the Lord did tempt Abram or Abraham. And so you might be led to believe that God did tempt somebody. God tempted Abraham. There is a difference between being tempted to sin and having your faith tested. And while the word tempted is in Genesis 22, 1, it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean tempted to sin. God tried Abraham's faith. He didn't tempt Abraham to sin. And so there is this difference in nature. And God did try other people. He tried or tested Israel in the gathering of the manna, Exodus chapter 16. He wanted to see if they would follow his ways. And so he told them to gather the manna a particular way, and he would prove them, test them, to see if they would follow his commands. Again, not a temptation to sin, but a test of one's faith. James says the subject of sin cannot be attributed to God. God does not and cannot be said to tempt any man to sin. James then follows that with a couple of reasons. It's there in verse number 13. Why can't we say when we are tempted, we are tempted of God? The first answer is God cannot be tempted with evil. This has to do with God's character. It has to do with who God is. James says the reason you can't impugn God is because God is too good. In fact, God is infinitely good. To borrow John's words in John 1 and verse number 5, 1 John 1, verse number 5, John says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The perfect holy character of God would not tempt anybody to sin. God can't be tempted himself. And that brings us to the second point. In the same verse, 
James says not only can God not be tempted to sin himself, he says neither does he tempt any man. The infinite, perfect, holy character of God cannot be tempted to sin, and that using that character, he would not entice someone to sin. Ultimately, it would seem very odd if God tempted a man to sin against him and then condemned the man for sin. Well, that would absolutely impugn the character of God, and it would say unequivocally, God is not good, and God is not holy. And God is not just. And God is not fair. And none of those things are true. And so James says, when it comes to the subject of temptation, nobody can allege God is tempting me. Well, what then can we say? Brings us to the next verse. The reality, James says, another one of these universal statements. He says, but every man, some remnant will say, but each man. Just like in verse number 13, let no one say, here James says, but every man. Again, nobody's excluded. One of the things about temptation is it happens to everybody. Everybody is tempted, and everybody can be tempted, and that universally so. James says, but every man is tempted. But more than that, James tells us when we're tempted. I don't know what you think about your temptation up to this point in your life. It might be the case that you might be like many people who believe that, well, you're just out here trying to live in the world and temptation happens to you sometimes. Or you, it falls upon you. It stumbles upon you. And you just find yourself in it. And now you're having to make decisions to try to back yourself out of it. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like you're under assault all the time. This thing is always about me. I just can't seem to escape it. I, I do well some days and then not so well some other days. And I have great successes and terrible failures. There is a word in verse number 14 that's really important relative to the subject of temptation. Because James says, but every man is tempted. What's the next word in your Bible? When? Here is the then when temptation occurs. Here's when it happens. And when is that? Well, it's not random. It, it's, it's not like, well, I don't know what's going to happen next. It's not like I wake up in the morning and I'm going along and then somebody jumps on me and I have to make a decision to swerve out of the way of temptation. And sometimes I'm good and stuff. No, that's not at all the case. No, understanding temptation, James says every man is tempted when. When are you tempted? James says when he is drawn away. The word drawn away, it's used to describe uh, fishing, which I understand there's a tournament in the area here uh, going on. Well, I, I used to fish when I was a very young guy, and I, I don't do it anymore, but I enjoy it. Any people, any fisher, men, women here? No. It's going to be a great illustration. <laughs> okay, well, that sister in the back there, there was one. One. At any rate, you'd understand the illustration, though, because the, the dictionary says this with regards to this word. It says it's like a lure that a fisherman throws into the water. And the bait moves in the water and lures the fish to the bait. That's the idea of drawn away. The fish has been drawn away from safety by the lure that's in the water. And having been drawn away, now the fish is tempted to take the bait. When did that occur? When it was drawn away. Let me give you the answer to the end of this very quickly. It's right here. You know, if you wanted to reverse this, what would I do? Well, I would avoid being drawn away. If I could avoid being drawn away, I'd avoid being tempted. Because the temptation doesn't occur until I'm drawn away. Every man is tempted when? When he is drawn away. James goes further and says, when he is drawn away, how? Of his own lust and 
The illustration with the fish has limitations when you try to move it from fish to human. See, if we were talking about just fish, we would say the humans outthink the fish <laughs> because the lures are so lifelike. I mean, we're way past worms and corn. We're way past that. We've studied fish. We know fish. In fact, we've created lures that are so light. Some of them even have a little red on them. They look like blood in the water. I, I mean, some of these things are so lifelike, the fish has no idea. That's not real. And so what happens is when we stand on the outside and study the fish, we become great lures of fish. But now when you move the illustration from fish to humans, if you are the one being lured away, who's the fisherman? That's what most people would say. It's what I thought much of my life. I thought it was Satan. In fact, that's what I was taught. I grew up believing Satan knows my weaknesses. Satan is aware of my thoughts. Satan has me in his sights. And Satan is out here. He's baiting the hook and throwing it right in front of me. And every day I'm lured away by Satan being a fisherman. Here's the problem. Now with the Bible says. It took me a long time to realize that's not what the Bible says. In fact, look again at James 1, 13 and 15. And let me know when you come across the word Satan. Let no man say when he is tempted. Is that every human being? But every man is tempted when? Is that every human being? No man can say it's God. God is out of the picture. And Satan is never put into the picture. What does that tell us? What it tells us is you and I are both fishermen and fish. We're the one creating the lure for ourselves. Who knows you better than you? Nobody. Who knows what you want? Nobody knows better than you. It's why James says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what's the next word in your Bible? Own lust. Who is doing this to me? It turns out I am the source of my temptation. I'm the reason I'm struggling in my life. And in, in a very real sense, isn't that about as fair as it could be? Isn't that about as just as God could make it? God is not doing it to me, and he's not letting Satan do it to me. He is, he's put it in my hands. And so what I need to do then is figure out this next word. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts. That word, according to Strong's, means a longing for what is forbidden. Thayer says it's a desire, it's a craving, it's a longing for what's forbidden. What's the problem? The problem is I am desiring that which God has forbidden. And as a result of that desire, I'm being tempted to do what God has forbidden. My desire is what's messing with me. My desire is what's tripping me up. My desire is what's causing me to crave after the thing. God said no, and I said I want it. You know, it's not hard to see that very early in the Bible. I know you remember Genesis 3, don't you? Genesis 3, somebody could say, well, Satan is present in Genesis 3. That's right, he is. You could even go further and say, Satan lied to Eve, and you would be right again. Question, when God came into the garden, who did he hold responsible? Adam, did you eat of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and the last three words of that verse is, I did. God turned to the woman and he said, what have you done? She said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. 
How is Genesis 3 couched? It's couched in these words. When the woman saw the tree, that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the tree and she did eat and she gave to her husband with her and he did eat. Where's Satan? You see, God never accepted the devil made me do it. From the first sin to this very hour, that's never been an acceptable excuse. The fact that God held them accountable tells us it was their lust or her lust, certainly, that was the problem. Now, let's say this very quickly. Let's begin by noting the fact that the desires that you and I have are not sinful in themselves. Sometimes when people get to this point in the study, they say things like, well, our flesh is just evil. Not true. God didn't create us evil. The flesh is not the problem. We have desires, and those desires are normal and standard. Every human possesses them. In fact, when you and I get hungry, that's normal. When you and I desire companionship or we are attracted to the opposite sex, that's normal. When we want to be married to somebody, have a relationship with somebody, normal. When we have whatever desires we have, God created them, those are not the problems. What then is the problem? The problem is not the desires. The problem is how we seek to satisfy the desire. Therein lies the problem. God has made everything in the world for a specific purpose and it functions the way God made it. However, sometimes God says, this thing here is off limits. You can't have that. That is not designed for what you're trying to use it. For instance, God has not said no to sex. God has not said no to that. God has said it's for marriage. If you try to do that outside of marriage, you're desiring that which is forbidden. The action is not forbidden. It's allowed in marriage. It's forbidden outside of marriage. Now, if I then lust for that which is forbidden, now I'm tempted. Well, that's the way it works. It works that way with everything. Food is not the problem. The problem is what are you using food for? And what are you trying to accomplish with it? I've heard people use expressions like, well, it's comfort food. I wish we wouldn't say things like that. Because when you're down and feeling bad, you may very well need comfort. But he didn't make food to solve that problem. He made food to solve a hunger problem. If you need comfort, seek something else. Maybe God, maybe his word, maybe prayer, maybe his people. Seek something else. Use that which God made it for. But if you use it for this, and you eat every time you're sad, you're going to have problems. Because unfortunately in our world, you're going to encounter sadness and bad days once or twice a week probably. Yes, no, maybe so. This is not bad. You can have a relationship, but you can't use it for, for that. You can't mistreat these things. And that's what James is talking about. These things have uses. It's the reason Jesus could be tempted yet without sin. The, the, the temptation, the desires themselves are not the problem. The usages of them. If you read the Lord's temptation recorded in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, you will see that he had a desire for food and he had the ability to change rocks into food. But now, Satan's temptation of that, if you're the son of God, and if he's bread be made stone, prove it, use it for yourself, well now that would have been wrong. If you're the son of God, jump off the building and the angels will swoop down and the pride and everybody will see how great you are. Well, that would be the wrong usage for that. And so Jesus kept saying, no, 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 it is written, it is written, it is written. And every time Jesus gave an answer, it corresponded to a proper use for the thing in question. Twice Deuteronomy 6, once Deuteronomy 8. I could have that back with Deuteronomy 8, twice Deuteronomy 6, once of those three answers that the Lord gives, and each one corresponds to something God would resolve, not he himself. He was tempted, yet without sin. It is the desire for that which is forbidden that is the temptation. Now, what happens if I go forward? You'll notice verse number 15. James says if you do that, 
You carry away with your lust and entice. James says lust has conceived. It, gives, it brings forth sin. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. And if you go back to the fish analogy, that's exactly what happens. If the fish takes the bait, what happens next? We jerk him out of the water. We reel him in, quite literally. We reel him in. He's taken. He stops breathing. or well, His oxygen levels begin to fluctuate and go down. And you can see that by his flipping and floundering about on the uh, outside of the water. And pretty soon, uh, he's dead. And we take him, we clean him, we slather him, we batter him, and then we put him in some hot grease and mm, 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 good. What has happened? Lust have conceived. See, it brought full, it, it's grown fully, and now he's dead. Well, it doesn't quite work that way with us, in that he's not saying that we die spiritually. Sometimes when people read these things, they say, well, if you sin, you're dead spiritually. It's not really what it happens. The ha what happens is when you sin and it's, it's gone full grown, what happens is you become what the Bible describes as dead in sins and trespasses. There are three states of death in the Bible. One of them is the body without the spirit. James says that's dead. Okay, so the body without the spirit is death. And then on the other end, John says in the Revelation, when the soul is thrown into eternal damnation, John says that's the second death. Well, that's all there is in the scripture. There is this death, which if that's the second, then this becomes the first. So physical, we die and our body is put into the ground, our spirits, and then eternally when our spirits are thrown into the lake of fire, well, that's what happens in the middle. There is this thing in the Bible called dead in sins and trespasses. See, these two states are permanent. We can't bring you back from this one, and there is no returning from that one. But here in the middle, you are alive physically, but you are dying. You are dead in your sins. You are living a life of sins, and therefore you are dead to righteousness, Romans 6, 16 and 17. This is the state of the young man in Luke 15, where the father rejoices by saying, my son was dead. Well, he wasn't that, and he wasn't that. He was very much alive in the pig's pen, dead to the righteousness of his father and the life he once lived. And in this state, you can be revived. You can be made alive again. You can be quickened. You can repent. You can stand again. James says, when lust that conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, it brings forth this. You start, and here's the, the terrible nature of sin. You start down a path of, if you reach for it once, and it provided something good for you, the reason it'll be a temptation again is because it gave you some satisfaction. It provided something for you. It made you feel good. What happens is you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again, and pretty soon down the road, this thing has taken over your life. And you go from reaping some benefit from it to being a slave to it. It now puts you in bondage. And typically what happens in people's lives is they aren't tempted by a hundred different things. They're tempted by one or two. And chances are real good it's been a temptation for a very long time. Because the very first time they lusted after it, they had an opportunity to take it, and they did. And it was good. And they did it again. And they did it again. And pretty soon, there's a story told about a wild, wild Alaskan uh, wolf that uh, they could not catch or tame. It was killing the sheep. There was nothing they could do about it. It was so vicious that somebody came up with the idea to kill, actually kill a sheep. What they did was they took blood from the sheep and they put it over a sharp, sharp, sharp blade of buried it in the ice. The wolf smelled the blood and was drawn to it. Got to, the, got to the blood and began to lick the blood. And 
pretty soon the vicious nature of the wolf took over and it was so licking the blood that pretty soon the blood went from cold to warm. Next day they came out and the wolf was, was dead. It, it began to lick its own blood. Over time it just kept on and on and eventually they didn't have to kill it. It, it killed itself. Now you'll forgive me if that's too graphic, but that is about as good a picture of sin as I can think. Because that's what happens to us. We start out with lusting for that which is forbidden, and pretty soon we take it, and it invites us in, and it's good, and we take it, and we take it, and we take it, and pretty soon that thing has turned on us and enslaved us. And then we try to quit and realize I can't. This thing has gotten such a hold on me. And if you've ever been in this situation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now listen, I'm not asking for anybody to say anything. I'm asking for you to think with me, though. Because if you've ever been in this situation, you know very well what it is. And you have tried very likely to extricate yourself. You've tried to get out. You've tried to quit. And here's the mistake that most people make. When they try to quit, they try simply to get rid of the object in question. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but I'm saying that won't work long term. If you've ever struggled with, uh, well, my vice used to be sweets, and I mean vice. I don't mean to tell you it was a, a sample or a dabble. It was not. Some people, uh, talk, they find out that I don't try to eat sugar now, and they're like, man, you're missing out. They have no idea. Me and sugar have had a relationship that was just, uh, let me tell you, this was a deep, full of conviction and commitment relationship. I ate more sugar than I did food. Uh, desserts, I mean, I was in, and one day I tried to quit. And my way of trying to quit was to get it out of the house. And I had a lot of getting to get to. Uh, we had everything in the house. And I remember I would just throw it away. I would get rid of it. I'd say to myself, I'm so sick of this. I'm just tired of it. I'm done. I just throw it away. Whole pack of Oreos in the garbage. I knew it was bad when I started walking by the trash can looking. I knew it's bad now, buddy. There's no way you're going to go back in the trash. Surely you won't. But you know what? I didn't dump the pack out. I placed it in the trash. Hold. Just in case I might pass by and it called me. And it did. And I just happened to be in the kitchen passing and heard Psst. I look over, and there's a whole pack of Oreos. Who would throw a whole pack of Oreos away? Somebody must have made a mistake. Let me get that out, set it back up here, and let me just brush off what's there on top of the package. And I don't know who created that resealable package that Nabisco, they should be barred from just, they're wrong for that. And sure enough, I opened that thing back up and got me a few more Oreos, and then I realized, did you just grab a pack of Oreos? I realized, well, throwing them away won't work. So this time, let me dump them out. I never went back for those that I dumped. I just want to put that out there. Never went back for the dump. I just bought a new pack. This is what happens when you try to simply remove the object. What has to happen is you have to revisit, explore, and figure out why you want that item that you know you shouldn't have. Why do I want it? What is it doing for me? And until you figure out the why and dismantle it, and friends, you're going to be drawn back to this thing over and over and over again. I was somewhere preaching and some young people were struggling with pornography. And I talked to those young people and began to ask them, what are you watching? What are you doing? Because when you're alone, you can't fill your mind with bad stuff and then hope to 
figure your way out of it. If you don't change your heart and your mind about the item, it's going to keep coming. The temptation is going to be there. The Bible calls it repentance. It is a change of mind, the result of godly sorrow. I am not satisfying something that's good for me. I'm using something God has forbidden in a way he didn't intend it for, and it was for my good. He forbade that for me, and I am taking it and harming myself. And until I come to this realization and this willingness to make a change, friends, I'm going to keep struggling with this temptation. I have to understand. To that end, I've got to be honest with me. And I've got to ask myself, and you've got to explore these things in your own self and in your own mind and in your own heart. Because not everybody is tempted by the same thing and not everybody is succumbing to the same thing. There are some people who have no interest in alcohol. You could put alcohol in front of them. It's like, man, I, I wouldn't drink that if it was the last thing on earth and I was about to die thirst. I just wouldn't drink. And no interest. And there are other people who, if they had to stand around it for five minutes, they'd shiver and they shake for fear of trying to take it. And that's true of everything. It really doesn't matter what the object is. Sometimes people get fixated on the object. Oh, you're a terrible person because you did X. Oh, you're a worthless human being because you participated in Y. What is the difference, you tell me? What's the difference between Genesis 3, Joshua 7, and 2 Samuel 10 and 11? If you don't know what those references are, Genesis 3 is Adam and Eve in the garden. Joshua 7 is Achan, and 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is David and Bathsheba. What is the difference between these three things? <coughs> Nothing, something, anything? I, well, what are the temptations? What did the people do in these three things? They all sin. There is food. There is money and garments and clothing, possessions. And then there's sex. And a person. Food. Gold, garments, money, possessions, and a person. And what happens to each one? They saw it, they desired it, they took it. Sometimes people get fixated on the wrong thing. I, the question is not what's happening to somebody else. The question is what's happening to you. And the question is what are you going to do to overcome it? Let me then in the time we have remaining, how much time is that? Three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, how much time? That sounds good. Three, three minutes. With that in mind, then, let's get to a few quick tips then, some things that you can do. Number one, identify your lust. What is it for you? Don't worry about other people. You've got to figure you out. What is it for you? Identify it. Be honest with yourself. Number two, isolate it. Why do I want that thing? Why do I want it? And what am I using it to accomplish? It's providing me something. I'm reaching for it for a reason. What is it that I'm hoping to do with that? And is that in harmony with God and his will and his word? You need to be honest with yourself. Number three, develop a plan to neutralize it and defeat it. What's some of the plan? Guard your heart. You know, uh, one of the things that is certainly true, if I struggle with sweets, it'd be best not to bring sweets into the house. That would be best. But a bigger and better solution is to learn self-control. I had people say to me on my way trying to get rid of it, I heard people say, well, just eat a little bit. Well, that's great if you're not addicted. Yes, just eat a little bit. I need to get there. I got to learn self-control. I can't let this control me. I got to learn to control myself and to control it. And yes, it would be far better to be able to, as I've heard some people say, no, I just eat one of those little bite-sized candy bars. I've only eaten those because that one was in the bag. Not because I intended to stop at one, but I need to learn self-control. And that's true of everybody. I need to learn self-control. Guard your heart, Proverbs 4.23. You and I should not sit and consume information that's detrimental to our temptation. I shouldn't become a willing participant to allow somebody to put into my mind the very thing I'm trying to quit. 
And very often, that's exactly the way it works. Learn God and his goodness. God loves you. God wants what's best for you. God is on your side. Uh, and then there are other things. One of the things is you've got to learn your triggers. You've got to know when I'm down, I realize I do that. When I'm angry, I've seen that I do that. When I'm upset, bothered, when I'm under a lot of stress, I have found that I tend to, well, if I learn my triggers, then I can learn to respond better to my triggers. A lot of people don't realize the stress is aiding their reaching. The anger is aiding the reaching. The frustration is, sometimes it's other people. Sometimes, boy, the more I try to parent, the more I find myself reaching. Sometimes it's children. The more I try to talk to my parents, the more I find myself reaching. Sometimes it's husbands and his wife, our marriage. And the more it does this, then I do that. You've got to find your triggers. Worry and stress and anger all play a part. Draw closer to God. James 4, 7 to 10. Resist, submit, draw near, mourn, and humble yourselves, James says. That probably three minutes. What do you think? I just go to the kids coming in. Kids, kids aren't in yet. They're out there. Kids are in. <laughs> Thank you for your kind of They might just be more polite for you, though. They want to march in a little bit. 